Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we'll be going ahead and starting in about another 30 seconds as we just wait for a few more people to roll in. Um, and I'm really excited for this. Hope you guys are excited to learn a bit about blockchain. Um, also, uh, throughout the presentation, if anyone has any questions in the bottom left hand side of your screen, uh, you'll have a little question box and you can go ahead and put in any questions you have there and I'll see them and then I will go ahead and answer them as throughout the presentation. Um, and then there'll also be time for a Q&A at the end. Um, finally, uh, I just put a little vote. Uh, there should be a little box there that also lets you vote. And just getting a little bit gauge for where the audience is at is, do you own a cryptocurrency, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or uh, anything else? Um, just excited to hear what you guys are, where, where you guys are in the, how much you know. And we'll go ahead and start um, right about now. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, this is, my name is Sunny Agarwal and I am a second year student studying electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm a member of an organization here at Berkeley called Blockchain at Berkeley, which is an organization that focused on working with Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and other blockchain technologies, and bringing this to um, learning, getting students involved with this industry and really pushing the industry forward. And I'll be going ahead and talking a bit about our organization at the end. But um, so a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today is first we're going to go over why should you care about blockchain? What is blockchain? Why is it important? That whole spedazzle. Then we'll go a little bit about Bitcoin and consensus. From there, we'll step into um, understanding the different types of blockchains and what, it, what we can do with it. And then after that, we'll flow into some use cases. What can we actually, now that we understand this technology a little bit, what can we do with it? Uh, finally, we'll be going into a bit of a blockchain powered future and um, a bit about what our organization does. So. Let's just jump right in. So why should you care? Um, first off, like this is a brand new technology. Um, why, why is this important? Why are people getting so hyped about this? That it's a huge industry now. Uh, if you look at the current uh, market caps, uh, they're very high. Um, so why are people so excited about this? Also, someone just asked a question about if we're gonna be including smart contracts, and yes, we will. We'll be talking all about smart contracts the second half of the presentation will be, will be very focused on that. Um, so let's talk about what are some of the main trends that we see in technology as a whole, right? So what we have is first is digitization. And we can look at this through communication. We had very under, the communication industry has been pushing forward. Just we went from the Pony Express to telephones to email. And now we have instant messaging and everything's on your smartphone. Communication has gotten more and more digitized, allowing it to happen faster and more open, right? And we see that this trend actually has come over to money. Um, now, 90% of money exists in the digital realm with only 10% of it existing in the physical realm. And so this is a trend that money really has caught up with the rest of the world. It is embracing a very digital future. But so where, where does Bitcoin come in? We look at the second trend that we see happening in the world right now, which is decentralization. If we look at some of the biggest companies today, such as Air Uber or Airbnb, we see that there's this large force towards decentralization, opening up markets that are industries that were traditionally very centralized and opening up and exposing them to market forces. And so what, how can we apply this to something like currency, right? Uh, how can we decentralize anything that allows us to Exposed to market forces, which will bring things cheaper, as well as removing central points of failure. Because part of a huge thing about blockchain is how can we increase security in our financial system? So let's look a little bit about how this uh, centralization versus decentralization theme works out. Um, if we look at something in computation, we started off with big mainframe computers, supercomputers that you'd have to log it, uh, check out time on. And we've slowly shifted over to more things like cloud computing, PCs, where you have decentralized computing, very parallel processing. Um, in communication, we had the Bell system, very centralized, where one, one company basically controlled all the world's telephone lines. And then we shifted to the internet, which is a very decentralized system that anyone can plug into and basically be a part of this growing network. 
And so that's where really blockchain comes in now. In the past, we had big data. You, you trust a few big companies to contain all the data in the world, whether it's um, company data, if you're putting it all on Amazon servers, or if it's financial data, you're trusting the big banks with uh, all the financial data, or even a company like PayPal. And so that's where blockchain comes in as a way of decentralizing the data side of things. And some of the benefits of this are, of course, the adaptability, robustness, and uptime that a decentralized system allows you to achieve. So going off of this, what is the best mental model for thinking of blockchain is really um, internet was created as a way that we can sh anyone can share information instantly and censorship resistantly, right? Any, anyone now has the ability to go on the internet and post their thoughts for the entire world to see. Blockchain is basically a way that we've created to share value instantly, something that has tangible, real value. And so we'll be discussing a little bit about how that works um, when we start talking now about Bitcoin. So a lot of people in this industry, in the blockchain industry, want to try to sell the vision that, oh, blockchain, oh, it's completely different than Bitcoin. Bitcoin has, Bitcoin is a dirty word that's been associated with drug markets and the like. And they say, oh, no, blockchain is very different. But in reality, anyone who says that is kind of doing some marketing there because Bitcoin truly was the first blockchain. And to understand blockchain, we do have to have an understanding of Bitcoin. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what is Bitcoin and what was its big innovation, the big idea. So Bitcoin was a bit way, basically, we wanted a way to transact something of value without a central authority in anti-PayPal of sorts. PayPal basically went ahead and did the digitization trend of money for us. But now we want to say the problem is PayPal is a very centralized unit. The amount of data that they have on everyone, the fact that if PayPal goes down, the entire system shuts down. Everything's being stored on a single server. Or if it's a single centralized solutions are uh, hackers love that because if they can get into one system, they can take down the entire like, financial system if they wanted to. So this was really the inspiration for the blockchain and Bitcoin. How can we create this secure system that's not controlled by any company or in fact by any government either? And so this is where the idea of a cryptocurrency came in. Um, and it uses a lot of decades of cryptography and computer science research in order to create this uh, value system that is able to be maintained by a network of peers and instead of one single authority, which we will be going into a little bit. Um, so what was Bitcoin? It was the brainchild of a person named Satoshi Nakamoto and he published a paper online in 2009 and the thing is, no one actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Uh, he published this paper under a pseudonym, which, uh, so it's not really, there's a lot of theories as to who this person is, but the really important thing to know is it doesn't really matter who it was. The idea is that the beauty of this system is you don't have to trust the person who created the system. The only thing you actually have to ever trust is in the math and in the code that he published. And so what he did was he basically took a bunch of existing technologies actually and figured out how to combine them to create this system. He took a lot of cryptography and computer science technology such as SHA-256 hashes, public private key cryptography, a lot of ideas from past decentralization technology such as BitTorrent or the Tor network and basically combined a lot of these ideas together in order to create this trustless system that allows people to create transactions and have something of value. Um, and the beauty of the system, what, what was the key insight was it prevented anyone from being able to mint Bitcoin um, out of nothing. So the biggest problem with creating a digital currency is how do you prevent anybody from just duplicating and replicating it? And so it's really in this uh, cryptography of the SHA-256 hash and a lot of the network effects that basically we allowed this to happen. I'm not going to go too much into the details of how mining and uh, all the verifications, all this works, 
Um, if anyone's interested, feel free to ask a question near the end, and I have a few slides prepared that I can go into that. But right now, let's talk a bit more about the higher level and what the use case, what, what the vision for this technology is. And so once Bitcoin was created and created this value system, a lot of people had ideas like, oh, wait, I have a way to improve this. I have a way to improve uh, one feature. And the thing is, uh, Bitcoin has tens of billions of dollars worth of value locked up into it because so many it's it was the first techno cryptocurrency so it's sort of the gold standard of cryptocurrencies if you will and the idea is if you want to test out new features you usually don't try them on bitcoin because you don't want to accidentally mess up so what this did was it inspired the creation of new cryptocurrencies uh in order to test out new features such as you had currencies like ethereum uh litecoin which implemented a new um like public-private key cryptography method. We had a currency called Zcash, for example, which aims to be a little bit more anonymous than Bitcoin. And then you had a few joke currencies along the way, such as Dogecoin, which uh, doesn't really quite exist too much anymore. But that's what happens that that seems to be one of the few currencies that people, everyone's heard about. Um, so what are, so how do you get involved with Bitcoin, right? It's first step is you create a wallet. What is a wallet? Um, it's any sort of software that holds your public and private keys, right? What is a public and private key? So when you want to make an account in Bitcoin, and I'm saying account with quotation marks around it, is you need to create a private key and that private key gets turned into, you can hash that into a public key. And you can think this of this almost as a password and email address where your public key is your email address which you publish online. And if anyone wants to send you an email, once they have your email address, they can send you money to that. Same thing with uh, Bitcoin. If you publish your public key online, anyone can look at that and send money directly to your public key. While the private key acts more of a password, if you're on an email, um, you and if you want to create a new email and send it to someone from an account, you need the password to that email account. Same thing goes for Bitcoin. Uh, you need the private key in order to create a new transaction to spend money into from, from an account. One place where it actually uh, differs a little bit from the email analogy is when it comes to reading an account. Part of the whole uh, trade-off you make when using a blockchain is everything is made public. All information is openly available on the blockchain. So in an email, you typically also need the password to read all the emails in an account. However, on a blockchain, even without the private key of an account, you can actually see all the transactions that have come into an account. So you can uh, see how much money is in someone's account. And so this leads to the question like, hey, wait, wasn't the whole point of Bitcoin to be anonymous? Like, well, how does it help if everyone can see how much money is in my account? So the thing is, Bitcoin is not actually anonymous. It's actually something called pseudonymous, which it means that anyone can look in and see how much money is in a particular account. What they can't see is who owns which account. And so this is a process called pseudonymity. And there are actually a lot of currencies that are working towards how can we make things anonymous, such as Zcash. But that's really a story for another time. Um, so who regulates Bitcoin, right? If you don't have a central authority, what actually you do is you, it's almost like a democratic system in which the network regulates everyone else. And so the idea is hopefully no one person or one malicious entity will own more than 50% of the nodes in a network, right? And so that means anyone can just go join a, this network. It, all it requires is a computer. There's, unlike the email analogy where you go on Google and ask them, hey, someone, can I join your email services? Uh, here, it's open to anyone. All you need is a computer. You install the Bitcoin client. And all peers are, you just connect to a few peers and become part of this larger network. And all peers are created equal. So I'm putting a little asterisk next to that because one of the key innovations that Bitcoin actually figured out was if all you need is a computer to create, to join this network, can't someone just buy a lot of very, very cheap computers and plug them into the network and suddenly gain a majority of power nodes in the network, right? 
this is something what's known as a Sybil attack. Um, so what Bitcoin did to solve this problem was it said, hey, how about instead of just having one computer be a, have one computer, one vote, we need a better way to distribute votes. And this is where the concept of mining comes in, which you may have heard of. Mining is the process that, how about instead of every computer getting a vote, computers have to solve these really hard math problems. And the more math problems they solve, the more votes they get. So what this has essentially done is it, if you want to get more votes, it will charge you, it'll cost a lot in computation power, which then turns into electricity com consumption and external costs. So it's now economically infeasible for any one person to basically outspend the rest of the network in computation costs. And so this is really one of the key innovations, this mining uh, concept that really secures Bitcoin because it assumes that no one malicious entity will ever gain more than 51% of the computational power on the network. So back to the previous question about how do you join? Yes, of course, anyone can join. There's no formal registration process. All you need to do is generate a public and private key and you gain, you secure access to funds. So that means you have to buy some, you have to obtain Bitcoin. You can do that either by buying it from someone else that you know. You can go on an online exchange such as coinbase.com and buy Bitcoin from there. Or you can go ahead and actually start, uh, use a computer as a mining rig. And what, ha what mining does is because people are donating their computational power to the network in order to secure it, what they'll do is they'll get re rewarded over time with something called a mining reward, which is every, for, for the amount of power that you give to the network, you'll get compensated in Bitcoin. And this is actually how new Bitcoin gets added into the system. It's a sort of built-in inflation. So when you join this network, what do people know about you, right? Not much, right? Because since there was no central regulation, um, there's no one, no one will know who you are. All you exist as to people on the network is an account address, which is really just a random set of numbers. And so if you don't share your public key publicly, you can now make transactions without anyone ever knowing your identity. All you have to do is send your public key to someone who wants to send money to you. You send it to them privately and they will, no one ever has to know that you are the holder of some Bitcoin. And so this makes it very difficult to trace activity on the network, which is why it's been very popular for um, drug marketplaces and such. But it's actually not impossible to uh, trace activity, which is uh, a many, this is why there's a lot of development being put into stuff like Zcash, which is in order to make it even more anonymous. So, I mean, then the question is, right, like, wait, why is everyone so excited about this? Like, if, are we just basically creating a currency to enable drug dealers to go through their business and avoid government regulation? I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. What I really see is Bitcoin is, has a huge future in the developing world. Um, I met with Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, he's the, literally the creator of the textbook on Bitcoin. Uh, he has a textbook called Mastering Bitcoin. And he basically travels the world right now giving talks about Bitcoin. And he really opened my eyes and showed me that like, hey, the place we need Bitcoin isn't the United States. The United States has a relatively stable government, good financial systems. I mean, I'm putting an asterisk that if like you really trust the banks after 2008. But um, where we really need uh, Bitcoin is places like Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, where he mentioned to me that in Africa, over 90% of the, uh, I'm sorry, less than 50% of the population doesn't have access to financial services. And so half the population doesn't have access to financial services, but 90% of them have access to the internet. And so this, this huge dichotomy in the world that people have better access to technology than financial systems. And so now what if we can put these financial systems implement them through technologies, which is what Bitcoin allows us to do. As well as the fact that in a lot of developing countries, 
unlike the U.S., we don't have the most, they don't have the most effective governments that are necessarily competent. And sometimes not only are governments um, incompetent, sometimes they're very actively malicious. Uh, if anyone's been following the news that's been going on in Venezuela this past week, there's a lot of trouble going on in this country. And that's why a lot of the citizens in Venezuela are uh, depending on Bitcoin in, in order to find a stable currency that's not uh, going to be inflated by their government. And so Bitcoin really can provide this solid uh, financial system for the rest of the world. So, but enough about Bitcoin. Well, we, the idea of introducing Bitcoin is more just to give a basis of like a little bit of the precursors to why blockchain was created. Let's take a foray into what are some of the different types of what can we do with blockchain now? So the real fundamental shift that happened with this shift from Bitcoin to blockchain was people realized, hey, wait, we created this really cool, what we created was not really just a decentralized currency. What we created was a decentralized database, which we happen to use in this situation specifically for creating a currency. But in reality, we could use this decentralized database for decentralizing almost anything, whether it's decentralizing an asset, uh, a non-currency asset, um, decentralizing the internet, decentralizing a computer. And this is what really got the gears turning on the blockchain industry. What else can we decentralize? So let's talk for a second about what is the blockchain, right? So it's the technology underlying Bitcoin. It's the data management infrastructure. It's what allows all of these peers on this network to come to consensus on what is the state of the network. How much money does each account have? And this was, and how can you prevent anyone from modifying the, the database and giving themselves an exorbitant amount of money that they didn't actually get? Um, it's, and it provides an unbreakable chain of truth where once the, a blockchain is in a certain state, no one can go ahead and revert it and say, oh, wait, uh, they can't send money to someone and then tell everyone, oh, wait, no, I didn't actually send them money. It is on the blockchain and therefore it's undeniably true that they in fact sent this money to person B. So what are the different kinds of blockchains that we can go off of, right? There's three, we have three main types here. We uh, ideas that we see is we started off with centralized systems, which is um, very like one point of failure. Then you switch to decentralized and finally to distributed, which is everyone is an equal peer in the network. And so this, these three steps kind of give us a different looks into what are the different kinds of blockchains that we can use. Um, we have the, obviously the public blockchains, which are, things such as like Bitcoin and Ethereum that's open for everyone to get involved with and anyone can kind of plug into the network as I mentioned before when I was talking about Bitcoin. You have consortium blockchains, which is essentially, it's a blockchain that's designed only for a certain amount of people to use for a select group. An example of this is a blockchain between multiple banks where you, all these banks don't necessarily trust each other and want to create a trustless system through the blockchain. But what they will do is they'll trust a quorum of the banks. So if you have a group of 15 banks, any one bank will say, I don't trust one bank, any other specific bank, but I'll trust that no 10 banks are colluding with each other. And so you can create this decentralized system of transacting assets between banks that uses a blockchain, but it's not like me, I can go ahead and join this blockchain that's designed for these 15 banks. So that's what a consortium blockchain is. And a fully private blockchain is a blockchain that's used within a company, which yes, does seem to defeat the point of a blockchain to an extent, but there can be some potential uses when it comes to things like security, or if you have a very large organization with multiple access levels. Um, so we'll talk more, more a little bit about the public and consortium blockchains for this talk though. Um, 
So these are just some examples of some of the bigger projects that are going on within the blockchain uh, ecosystem. You have, uh, you can make this distinction between platforms and software, whether um, a blockchain project that's being built out, is it supposed to be the end result? Is, is, are they selling it as a software for people to use or are they um, use, deploying it as a platform for other people to build on top of? So when we talk about public blockchains, right, the public platforms that we see are things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, while the software is something like Hyperledger. And I'll be going a little bit into uh, the differences between Ethereum and Hyperledger in a little bit. But meanwhile, on the other side of things, uh, we have some private blockchains, such as companies like Ripple, Eris Industries, um, Digital Asset Holdings, uh, which, by the way, was created by Blythe Masters, who was the sort of the inventor of the credit default swap, which, uh, so as you can see, there's still some shady people involved in the blockchain industry a little bit. But um, so let's talk about the, ma the main blockchain that I really want to focus on right now is one called Ethereum, because I think this is really the one that's pushing the for industry forward right now and is the biggest enabler of opportunity and really unlocks the potential of what blockchain can accomplish. So what exactly is Ethereum? If we, it basically looked at Bitcoin and said, okay, Bitcoin has a very basic scripting language built on top of it. It's, um, you can write a little bit of like logic into Bitcoin, but nothing too advanced. So what B Ethereum said was, hey, instead of taking a light scripting language, let's put a full Turing complete language on top of this currency. And what Turing complete means is that you can basically write anything you could write in code, you can basically write it on this Ethereum blockchain now. And so what Bitcoin originally started as was a decentralized asset, right? How can we create this currency? What Ethereum has become now is a decentralized computer. It's any app that you could have written in a centralized manner, you can now write in a decentralized manner. And this now opens up a world of opportunity, which will be going into some of the use cases that you can do with this. And so Ethereum does have a currency that's built in uh, called Ether, but this is, the Ether is not the end goal of Ethereum. Really, it's just a mechanism to enable the real goal of Ethereum, which is something called smart contracts. So what are smart contracts? Let's first discuss what's a contract, right? A contract is just an agreement between individuals or entities. And so traditional contracts are designed to be enforced by the law. However, this is problematic as there are a variety of reasons that this doesn't always work out how you want. For example, let's say you're a small company doing a behemoth. What if they just try to outspend you in legal battles? Let's say you're a small construction company that got a big contract from Trump Incorporated and they try to now, after you've completed the work, they say, oh, we're just not gonna pay you as much as we said we will. And you, you just simply don't have the legal re resources to take them to court. And so you're kind of stuck into taking less lesser payment. Um, this is a big problem, right? So a smart contract is a contract that's written in code and it's designed so the contract is always executed properly and it can never be violated. So what this means is that's why we needed this like ether currency built on top of the, into the system where what Trump Incorporated now can do is they can put in their ether into a holding contract and the money will only be, rele will be released to the construction company once the building has been created properly. And so neither side can basically go back on their promise. But now the question is, why can't you just build this uh, code into a centralized computer? Just trust a third party to run the code and make sure it always carries out perfectly. The problem with this is, is sometimes a large behemoth has the ability to bribe the central authority. And now you have to find this third party central authority, which there have been many cases in the past where third parties who have been trusted uh, to run this code 
have been get, in fact been bribed and engaging in sketchy practices and the system just doesn't work. So what we really need to do is create a secure, trustless peer-to-peer -peer agreement without the need for a third party. And so let's see how, what, what, once we figure this out, what can we do with this? Let's think of some use cases. Obvious, so the first use case we come up with is, this is kind of a bit meta, but let's go ahead and destroy the rest of the blockchain industry. Um, in Bitcoin, we used to have an idea called colored coins, which has been phased out because of what Ethereum enables you to do. You can go ahead and create Bitcoin on Ethereum in a few lines of code. Because really, like we said, all Bitcoin is is a decentralized database. So what we have here is um, we have a currency that we create a database on the Ethereum network. And basically, all we have is a name, account name, to an amount of Ether that they own. And if all we have to do is increase, if we can create a function called send that allows anyone to send money from their Ethereum account on this contract to another Ethereum account on this contract. So it's very simple to create a brand new currency on Ethereum. For example, I just did it right here. I went ahead and created a coin called Sunny Coin, and this is essentially pretty much 90% of the code that you need in order to make a coin. You need a way for people to buy an initial supply, uh, ability to transfer money from one account to another account, and you need a way for people to check their balances. And so one of the big movements you're seeing in this industry is everyone is starting to build on Ethereum, where instead of people in the past, a lot of companies were trying to say, hey, let's make our own blockchain and so we can have this new idea. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, on Ethereum, a lot of these new companies such as Storage and Digix, Golem, uh, Library, all these companies are building their new products on top of Ethereum. If you want to create a new token for your app, all you have to do is just implement it as a coin on Ethereum. So what else can we do with uh, uh, Ethereum? What's another use case? What about a public registry, such as a DNS system? Um, about six months ago, there was one uh, a hack on a DNS server in Maine, which caused essentially the internet for the entire East Coast to go down because of a, this is here we see the failings of a centralized system, uh, especially when it comes to something like DNS. So what if we create a decentralized database on Ethereum that maps a domain name to an IP address? So for example, we can take brighttalk.com and map it to this IP address. And because this is a public blockchain that's visible to anybody and everybody, even if one node in this blockchain goes down, this data is still owned by everyone else on the blockchain, which means that they, it's always going to be accessible, as well as this one DNS server or hacker could not just modify the entry in the DNS system and say, for example, make uh, google.com go to their own website that they could use in a phishing attack. This now, if uh, in this Ethereum blockchain, you would have to provide some sort of proof to the network that, hey, I am the true owner of google.com. And so anyone who doesn't actually own that domain won't be able to remap its uh, domain to a different IP address. Um, and once again, this is an example directly from the Ethereum white paper of a very simple function that you can use to uh, basically create this DNS system on Ethereum. Um, another big thing you can do with um, Ethereum and blockchain is you can create new incentivization structures. Um, this is actually an example, blockchain is an example of an app that I made at a hackathon a few months ago. And it basically allows you to put a bounty on the completion of any kind of task. When we created this um, idea, what we want, what we had in mind was a way for a large group of people to come together and pool together their money and basically sell shares to this pool of this pool to lobbyists. And basically the money will only get released from this pool if the lobbyists successfully carry out what they said they will. 
For example, let's say a large number of people want to remove the death penalty in the state of California. Um, what they can do is pool together their money and a lobbyist that's ineffective will try, will have to buy a share of this pool in, in order to try to win the entire pool. But the thing is, if they actually fail and don't actually get death penalty abolished, the money that they use to buy the shares will be added to the pool. And now this pool, let's say it was $5 million originally, and the lobbyists bought shares for $2 million. Now this pool is $7 million, which basically the shares will get recreated and uh, can be resold. And this is basically, all of this is implemented in code. And the beauty of this is that means it needs nobody watching it and executing the code. It will run automatically. The, uh, for example, the time cliff that the lobbyists have to execute what they uh, said they will. That's all implemented to, through code. You don't, because some of these things take maybe let's say five, 10 years to enact. And you don't want to have to depend on whoever made this code to like say, okay, it's five years from this time, have the lobbyists done it. No, the system will automatically execute itself. And that's part of the whole beauty of the, what the blockchain allows you to enable. Um, the decentralized escrow, this is sort of a good example of the previous example I was giving as you can have uh, media, you can have the smart contract act, act as the third party. So you don't need a real third party. You don't have to trust in any person you trust in a piece of code that you can verify is true. Um, blockchain also enables things like brand new incentivization schemes. Uh, something, a really interesting phenomenon to come out of this is something called decentralized prediction markets, which basically it draws on the wisdom of the crowd in order to forecast the future. Two big ones are called Augur and Gnosis. And so what they, let's say you wanted to create a prediction market of who will win the 2020 US presidential election and people can buy shares of uh, different candidates. In this case, I use Trump and Mark Zuckerberg and pay a small fee. Um, and the idea is on, a, on election day, uh, oracles will basically decide who had actually, basically the network will decide who won the um, election and basically give a payout to the people who successfully predicted. And what makes this very different than a normal uh, betting market is the idea here is the purpose is your, to get information on a future event. So the idea is let's say you have a movie and you wanna know before the movie's released, will this movie be a flop? You can create a prediction market asking, will this movie be a flop? And the idea is the insiders of the network, the, the Hollywood insiders, maybe whether it's the director of the movie, a supporting cast member, uh, a backstage crew member who has more insight into this question because they have knowledge that's not available to, to the public is because now they have the ability to anonymously uh, partake in this um, prediction market, they'll do it as a way of making a profit for themselves and basically earn some money. Uh, but the thing is what this will do is the prediction market will end up going towards what the reality of the situation is. And it's a way of incentivizing people with um, who have access to public to information that's not public to disclose their knowledge. And you can use this for a multitude of different things such as insurance. Essentially, if we think about it, fire insurance is a bet that your house will burn down. So what you can do is create a market and say, will my house burn down and vote yes. And then everyone who's insuring you will vote no. And so if your house doesn't burn down, your money you'll lose after a certain amount of time, let's say the prediction market is one year. After that year, your money will end up going to the people who insured you. However, if your house did burn down, the insurer's uh, money will go to you. And so this is a way that we can once again, a great example of how can we cut out the third party. We're creating a peer-to-peer -peer insurance system instead of depending on, on large centralized insurance agencies. Um, another example of this is putting your money where your mouth is. Let's say you are a have a Kickstarter and say, I will release my product by a certain date. And what if you don't, right? So this is 
a way for you can say, I'm going to put down my money on this prediction market saying, I will really launch on time and bet heavily yes. So that way now, if you don't actually lock, launch on time, you'll end up losing money to the people who are hedging against you. And it's really sort of a way of putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about decentralized autonomous organizations. Decentralized autonomous organizations are a new way of thinking about organizations. A lot of these blockchain companies that we are talking about aren't actually incorporated as corporations in the United States, but are rather um, decentralized autonomous organizations where these companies exist solely on the blockchain. And the shares in these currents in these companies are the tokens that they distribute and implement on Ethereum. For example, Digix, um, their company exists solely on the blockchain. And if you own a currency called Digix DAO, those are really sort of just shares in the Digix company. And you can have built-in governments um, and code is the law. And so you can now even thinking even larger scale beyond just companies, you have now the potential to implement entire governments on blockchain if you wanted to and introduce new ideas such as there's a concept called futarchy where you can have prediction market based governance, whether it's in a company or in a government. Um, these are just some of the, it's a, you have to reimagine your way of conception of how systems work generally. And yeah. So a little bit about what's going on in the market. There's something called ICOs where it's sort of initial coin offerings. Um, it's a play on the word IPO, initial public offering. And just looking at these ICOs right now, we see that there's a lot of hype around this industry. This is from a company called Gnosis that just raised, that just got a $300 million valuation from the ICO that it did. And Gnosis is one of the companies that I was talking about is building these prediction markets. Um, at the same time, it's good to be a little bit hesitant because there are some companies that are, there's one company called Matchpool that's kind of creating Tinder on the blockchain, whatever that means. Um, and they raised over $5 million. And so if you're thinking about investing in ICOs and such, always be a little bit hesitant and really look into the technology of what these companies are trying to sell. So Ethereum and Hyperledger are really the two, com the two platforms that if you're interested in smart contracts, you, can, you should really be looking into and exploring how can we, if you're, com if you're a company, how can you use these technologies to change some of your business processes. Um, and companies are already looking into this. Like just this week, Spotify acquired a company called Media Chain. And so there are a lot of companies like big companies, IBM, all the big banks, Intel, all these companies are looking into blockchain, how they, we can, how it can change their fundamental business processes. So one of the biggest issue right now in the industry is there's a huge talent shortage and people are constantly, these are just some headlines I grabbed from the news over the past two or three weeks um, of different, everyone's looking for blockchain developers and it's a huge industry and it's going to become big. So in the last few minutes, um, I'm going to walk you through a day in blockchain utopia. And yes, I understand this is a little bit facetious, of course. But I think it's a good to take a look at what is the future and the vision for this industry. So, okay, one day you leave your apartment where you spent the night and as you leave, sensors detect your departure and Slockit, Slockit's a company that's working with IoT and blockchain, uh, detects your departure and basically it automatically pays back your security deposit. You order a coffee from Pete's on your phone and a notification pops up. It's a reminder to extend your payment channel with the global lightning network. Um, and you go ahead and do it because it's all secure and doesn't cost you any money and there's no transaction fees. So you go ahead and call your car, except the thing is, it's not really your car. It's plugged into an autonomous ad hoc swarm of vehicles readily available for use. Accidents are rare, but when they do happen, the insurance agency analyzes video footage via a machine learning trained bot 
and automatically gives the victim in the accident the appropriate payment, except it's not really an insurance agency. It's actually a smart contract that pools together the funds of a multitude of owners and charges people the exact expected value of car insurance, taking no profit for itself. The near exact probability of accidents is known because every accident that has ever happened is recorded on the blockchain. You had to work the next day, except the thing is, it's not really work. It's all voluntary because the blockchain ensures a universal basic income for everyone. And you're an engineer and researcher by trade primarily because you want to help push the boundaries of human knowledge. Your company isn't really a company either. It's a decentralized autonomous organization consisting of individuals from around the world who voluntarily signed up, receive compensation and pay raises based off the quantity and quality of their research findings as determined by a worldwide Oracle network. Your company itself receives revenue over time as measured by the net benefit to society that your research brings. For the few uh, functions left of government in society, um, we don't, we no longer look at uh, corrupt bureaucrats and politicians. Instead, society is run by a democratic futarchy in which markets decide what policies should be implemented and completely removing the possibility for corrupt politicians who know little to nothing about the fields that they write legislation for. And rather you get wisdom from the academics and uh, people who actually understand the systems better than any politician could. So of course, this was a little bit of a facetious take on blockchain, of course. And, but this really represents what I see as the future and vision for the industry. And so I'll just quickly talk a little bit about my own organization, Blockchain at Berkeley, where we have three main branches, education, R&D, and consulting. In the education department, we run a number of courses at UC Berkeley. We have about 120 students enrolled this semester in a course that we teach on cryptocurrencies as well as a number of workshops that we teach, uh, teaching people about development and how to actually program and build on the blockchain. Within our R&D department, which is the department that I run, uh, we have a number of teams that do uh, small team research projects, working on how we can improve the industry, how we can build new things, as well as finally we have the consulting arm, which is we go to companies and present on different things. This is an example of one of our teams presenting to Powerhouse about um, a blockchain that's designed for trading uh, renewable energy contracts. And finally, we have an advisory board which consists of some great professors, uh, Alessandro Chiesa, uh, Don Song, who are really some of the re leading forefront researchers in this industry. And so I hope I, I went a little bit over time, but I really hope that this presentation has given everyone some insight into the blockchain industry. And please feel free to leave any questions and I will get back to them. And go ahead and please sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Twitter.